and welcome to the Just In Center podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Jordan Cooper. Thank you so much for joining me once again on the program today. And I just want to give a quick reminder that Justin Center as an organization is supported by donors. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and uh, we, we really do need uh, your support to continue in, in the things that we do. So please consider becoming a contributor. You can go to justincenter.org, and there are a number of different ways you can donate. You can sign up for a Patreon. You can give through DonorBox, uh, and you can do other things to help us out like purchase some of our materials like the books that we uh, put out at jspublishing.org. Now um, on the program today I'm going to continue a series that uh, we haven't done much on in a little while and that's a continuing series on the Augsburg Confession. So uh, if you're not familiar with the Augsburg Confession this is the foundational Lutheran Confession of Faith uh, first uh, presented at the Diet of Augsburg in 1530. This is the most foundational statement of what it is that Lutherans believe. It was presented, um, you know, to both speak about areas of agreement with what was going on in the medieval church and, and areas of, of Catholicity and uh, to affirm the, the orthodoxy of the Lutheran position, but also to bring up the important areas of, of protest, important areas of where um, it was believed that the church had had erred. So this document continues to be really essential for us as Lutherans. So I've been going through this, um, you know, one article, maybe two articles, depending, uh, you know, per podcast as I, as I walk our way through the Augsburg Confession. And uh, on, on the last one of these that I did, we talked about the doctrine of baptism. So what it is that, that the Lutheran Church teaches uh, according to Scripture and according to our confessions on the doctrine of baptism. And now we have gotten to Article 10 on the Lord's Supper. So uh, if you haven't watched the others, I would encourage you to kind of go back and, and look at some of the others, especially when we talk about things like on the ministry of the church, uh, which is Article 5, where we you know have some details of some, some kind of groundwork that's necessary before we talk about the particulars of the sacraments. So in this section, uh, we have an outline of the sacraments. We have baptism, and then in Article 9 and Article 10, we have the Lord's Supper. And after this, in the next discussion we have in this series, we're going to be talking about both Articles 11 and 12, which speak about confession, absolution, and repentance, which uh, gets into the question of, of penance which is part, a very important part of the medieval system, which of course still is an important part of, of the Roman uh, notion of, of sacraments. So we're going to talk about the Lord's Supper. Uh, and the edition that I'm using here uh, is that of, of Charles Krauth. This is one that we put out, jspublishing.org. Uh, we put out this edition of the Augsburg Confession. Um, and what's really great about this is that it has a, a really detailed and helpful historical introduction to the confession uh, from Charles Krauth. And it also has a, a series of notes uh, throughout and at the end there there's a you know discussion about some points maybe of disagreement uh, in terms of interpreting the confessions and things like that so that's the edition that, that I'm working from here and I'm just going to read the section on the Lord's Supper is pretty short so we're going to read what it says and talk about what's going on historically here and look at some scripture that uh, that should be referenced as we're talking about this question okay article 10 part 1 of the supper of the Lord, they teach that the body and blood of Christ are truly present and are communicated to those that eat in the Lord's Supper, and they disapprove of those that teach otherwise. And, you know, there are some parenthetical remarks that are added here as well to, to clarify some of the, some of these things. So let's talk about what's going on here uh, and, and what's being said. Now, the question of the Lord's Supper at the time of the Reformation became a really key point of debate. It was a key point of debate, not just between uh, Protestants and, and Roman Catholics, but also between various Protestant groups. It, in fact, it became kind of the distinguishing mark of, well, the Lutheran Reformation as opposed to Zwingli's Reformation in Switzerland. So there, there are basically two sides that are being rejected in the Lutheran approach to this question. And the one is the, the Zwinglian approach. Now, Ulrich Zwingli, the Swiss reformer, taught that the Lord, in the Lord's Supper, uh, what we receive is basically just a memorial meal. We receive the, the body of Christ. Well, we receive not really the body of Christ, but we receive the wine, uh, the bread, which is a symbol of the body of Christ, and the wine, which is a symbol of, of the blood of Christ. Essentially, Zwingli interprets 
the, the words of institution, the phrase, this is my body as this represents my body. Now, well, we can get into some of the details of that as we get into the text of scripture and say, well, why did Zwingli come to that conclusion and, and what is there to kind of defend against that conclusion? So um, uh, on the one hand, we have the Swiss Reformation, which is in agreement with the German Reformation in many ways and in many areas in terms of critique of the church, but it was the concern of, of the Lutheran reformers that they had gone too far in rejecting what was a historic and, and ultimately biblical approach to, to the sacraments, including um, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, though dealing with baptism as well. So on the one hand, the confession is rejecting this idea that, that we receive merely bread and wine as signs or symbols of, of the sacrament of the altar of the Lord's Supper. So this is why uh, they say that we receive the body and blood of Christ. They are truly present is, is the, the phraseology that is used here. So it's truly present, really present, and meaning that it's not just symbolically present. It's not that the, the wine is a symbol of blood and that the bread is a symbol of body, but we receive the actual real body and blood of Jesus Christ. We receive the real body and blood for the forgiveness of sins as we partake of the sacrament of, of Holy Communion. So something real is going on here. And it's also important as we look at this and speak about what we mean by real presence to distinguish this from what ends up happening later in the Reformed tradition. So within the Reformed church, Zwingli holds to a position that's basically a memorial position. Some people have tried to argue that Zwingli didn't hold to a memorial position. There was more going on than that. I'm not convinced of that argument, but nonetheless, Zwingli held to the view that this is basically memorial. And later we have figures like Martin Bootser and then later John Calvin who argue that there's a lot more going on than just something purely symbolic, but they're not willing to come to the conclusion that there is a real presence of Christ, a real presence of his body and blood uh, in, in this, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. And so that idea is also rejected here by the language of a true and real presence. So what's the view of Calvin? What's the view of, of Bootser? Essentially, John Calvin and Martin Bootser, along with others as well, with, from within the, the Reformed tradition, they argue that there is something happening in the Lord's Supper, that there is this is not just a memorial meal. There is a real sharing in Christ. However, the sharing in Christ that happens is a sharing that is in faith and through faith, which means that for, for these figures, when we partake of the Lord's Supper, if we have faith through the work of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit mysteriously connects us to Jesus in as we partake of the Lord's Supper. But Jesus himself, according to his human nature, remains only in heaven. And we can talk about that a little bit as well as we delve into some of this. So Jesus is his human, according to his human nature, he is only in heaven. Therefore, his body and blood cannot actually be present here on the altar and in the elements of bread and wine. So the argument of the Augsburg Confession, the statements of the Augsburg Confession on this point are very clear that the real presence we are speaking of is not a presence in heaven that faith ascends to heaven and receives something elsewhere, but it is a real presence here and now in the church. We actually receive the body of Jesus in our mouths as we receive the bread. We receive the blood of Jesus in our mouths as we partake of the wine. Um, so, it, it, it is a real presence. We really receive him under the forms of bread and wine. Now, this article is going to become a point of debate and controversy later because the Augsburg Confession, as it's written in 1530, is the this is the edition. This is the version of the Augsburg Confession that is accepted today by churches of the Lutheran Reformation. Uh, which is what we refer to it as the unaltered Augsburg Confession. So sometimes on a Lutheran church building, you'll actually, you'll see the letters UAC, which means unaltered Augsburg Confession. And that UAC has to do particularly with this article, not exclusively, but mostly with this article. So that later, Philip Melanchthon, who was the primary author of the Augsburg Confession, changed some things in later editions of the confession. 
Now, th there's a bit of debate to be had about exactly what he meant by the things that were said. There's some debate among scholars who study Melanchthon uh, as to what he meant by the language that he that he used. But he, he changed some of the language, producing a new edition. Melanchthon didn't understand this document to be like kind of static or one that would just kind of always stay as it is. Uh, but but that's eventually what we did. We kept it in in, in its form because what we found was that when these documents had been altered, some of the meaning had shifted. But Melanchthon loosened some of this language. He started using different language that he brought into this particular article that then some of those who rejected this view of the supper, that the body and blood of Christ are actually present, they were able to then affirm it and say, well, we do affirm the Augsburg Confession because the language is loose enough that at least their argument was that Calvin's perspective, the Boots or Calvin view of the Lord's Supper, that's not purely symbolic, that that could fit under the, this article, this new uh, description of the Lord's Supper. So that's, that perspective uh, was rejected by the Lutheran reformers. And this is why when the Book of Concord was, was put together, which is the compilation of all of the Lutheran theological writings in 1580, the Book of Concord was very clear to adopt the original text of the Augsburg Confession because it was clearer, it was more unambiguous that we actually receive the body and blood of Jesus in our mouths as we partake of, of the sacrament of the altar. So one of the things that is then being rejected is that perspective. Now that's going to be a large focus of Luther's writings, especially later Luther. And Luther himself is going to end up saying that he, say, he says, I would, I would rather drink blood with the Pope than, uh, than mere wine with the Zwinglians. Uh, meaning that, that according to Luther, the view of the sacrament that was taught in the Roman Catholic Church was much closer to where he was coming from than where the Swiss reformers were coming from on this question. And he sees a fundamental continuity between his own perspective and that of the early church and in the medieval church. There are some differences in terms of the way that things are formulated with the idea of transubstantiation, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but we're really arguing or, or starting from the same starting point, which is we really do receive the body and blood of Jesus. Um, when, when Jesus says, this is my body, he really means that it is his body. He does not mean this represents my body. So there's a lot more commonality with with Rome and the Eastern Orthodox Church and those historic churches here than there is with with Zwingli and even the later perspective of someone like uh, John Calvin or or Martin Bootser. All right, so we have that on, on the one hand that's that's rejected here. So the idea here is that the the true body and blood of Christ, and sometimes if you if you go to a Lutheran service and you receive the body and blood of Christ, sometimes the, the pastor will say, this is the true body of Christ. This is the true blood of Christ. And, you know, I have a practice of, of saying that when I distribute the elements of communion, um, when I'm presiding over a communion service. And that's just kind of to, to emphasize. So you understand what's going on. You know, it's the true body. This isn't just body in symbol, some symbolic sense, but it's the true body, the real body, the very body of Jesus. Okay. So they are, they are truly present and truly communicated to those uh, who, who eat of the Lord's Supper. And then on the other side, you know, I mentioned there are kind of two sides. So the other side is, is the Roman perspective. Now, what exactly is the issue with Rome? Because the issue with Rome isn't really outlined in this particular article. And, and the function and purpose of this article is mostly to say that we're not on the side of the Zwinglians. Like they're trying to say, we are actually in continuity with the church. We are in agreement on this point. We're not departing from the faith of the church. This is why we have that, that final statement, which says they disapprove of those who teach otherwise. Like they disapprove of those groups, this kind of, those groups who were seen as the radical reformers. Now, generally radical reformer refers to the Anabaptists. Uh, but for Luther, Zwingli also was a radical reformer. You know, for, for the Lutheran tradition, at the time of the Reformation, those like Zwingli were also, were also radical. And Luther himself didn't really differentiate much between Zwingli and the Anabaptists. He kind of saw them as, as both part of the same general rejection of where the church had been historically. They're kind of throwing out the history of the church. They're, they're adopting kind of anti-sacramental perspectives. So it's not to say that you know, Luther was necessarily correct there, but for Luther, in the way that he sees it, that's really all part of the Radical Reformation. Like, it, it's all kind of part of the same the same error. 
Um, so that's being rejected. So the, the Lutherans are clearly distinguishing themselves to say, you know, to Rome, yes, I know you're critiquing these who say that this stuff is some purely symbolic. We're not coming from that perspective. Uh, we're not even saying that that's an allowable perspective, right? So they're not saying, well, some people have this view, some people have that view. They're saying we disapprove of those who teach otherwise. They're, they're not part of our movement. That's a totally different movement, which is why at the Colloquy of Marburg, when, when Martin Luther and, and Ulrich Zwingli got together to discuss their theology uh, and to kind of hash things out, uh, at the end, Luther said, we're not of the same spirit. Uh, L Luther was making the point that we, we can't work together for reform. We're really not coming from the same place. And, and they did have important areas of agreement. Uh, but for Luther, the sacrament of the altar, and I would say the sacraments more generally too, this relates to baptism as well. But the sacrament of the altar was enough of an issue for Luther to say, like, we, we cannot work together. We're not coming from the same place uh, in terms of what we mean by by reform and what, what our reform movements are trying to do so uh, but on the other hand we have then the roman view so what is the difference with the lutheran view in the roman view now we'll get into some particulars as we get later into the augsburg confession when we talk about practices because there are some practices that are rejected now the first section of the augsburg confession is dealing with doctrines so we're dealing with like what are key core doctrines that we believe so this is why we've talked about things like who god is we talk about the trinity we talk about the natures of christ original sin justification good works all of that um and then we're going to get into the abuses of the medieval church but so part of the groundwork in the very beginning is to say actually like we're not teaching anything different from christian orthodoxy that's always been considered christian orthodoxy and baptism and the lord's supper are, are a part of that but what eventually is going to come out um, is that there are certainly disagreements with how Rome has approached the supper in some ways. Now, one is that in this, this description here, the, the body and blood of the Lord's Supper are present under the forms of bread and wine. Okay, what does that mean? Because this is really the question that divides Luther, the Lutheran Church from Rome's perspective on transubstantiation. Now, if you're not familiar with transubstantiation, transubstantiation is the it's the Roman Catholic perspective on the Lord's Supper, and in the Roman perspective, there is uh, there is an essential transformation of the the earthly elements, which are bread and wine, into the body and blood of Christ, to such an extent that the bread and wine no longer remain. So the language is that the substance or what the thing is has changed but the accidents remain the accidents of bread and wine, which means this, the qualities of bread and wine are still there. Or the, uh, in other words, when you when you taste the bread of the, the in the Lord's Supper, you taste the host, it still tastes like bread. Like it still feels like bread, it still tastes like bread. If you drink the wine, it still doesn't taste like blood. You know, it tastes like wine. Uh, so the idea is those are the, the accidental qualities, which is a term that comes from Aristotle and some distinctions that he had between substance and accident. And the substance is what of a thing is, the accidents are the kind of qualities that a thing has. So, um, you know, for example, you could talk about like the essence of, you know, who you are as a person, uh, right? I, I am, you know, I am Jordan Cooper, that's who I am, but I have, but I have these qualities or these accidental features that are not essential to who I am, but they flow out of who I am, like, you know, my haircut and I, my, my beard or my clothing or my, um, you know, my height as I, you know, I was, I was a kid and grew taller, like, you know, that changes. So in other words, the accidental things can change, but the substance can remain the same, right? So if, you know, as, as I was a kid, you know, I grew up and so a lot of things change about my physical appearance, about my height, about my, you know, development of, of the intellect and development of character. Yet the essence of who I was remained the same. It's same you're the same essential person, but your qualities do change. So that, that's basically what the distinction means. So the essence of the Lord's Supper remains the same. So the essence is that, it, or sorry, the essence changes. So it, it's no longer bread, but it's the body of Christ. But the accidental qualities remain the same. So that's that's the way that they try to give a, a kind of philosophical explanation of what's going on in the Lord's Supper. Now, for, for Luther, this explanation really just tried to prove too much. It, it tried to, to put things in too precise of categories because these kinds of categories were just, they're just not there in scripture. Uh, scripture never says that the, the bread and wine cease to exist. And we'll look at the text here in, in 1 Corinthians, which seems to certainly imply that they do still exist in some way. 
So this was just, it was too philosophical, it was too much. You're, you're trying to explain away too many truths of scripture using things that aren't necessary. Um, the early church spoke very clearly about the body and blood of Christ being received in the sacrament without having to resort to this kind of language. Uh, the Eastern church does the same thing. So transubstantiation, it's not, is it the biggest error? Not really. It, it's just an, an issue of trying to explain things too much. I mean, that's really the problem. Um, does it really matter that much that the bread still remains in essence? Not really. Um, it doesn't really matter that much. The, the main thing in the supper is that we're receiving the body of Christ and the blood of Christ, which is why Luther is saying he'd much rather receive, you know, the, the blood with the papist than he would wine with Zwingli. Cause like the blood's the important part. And yeah, maybe they're, they're explaining too much with the language of trans transubstantiation. Uh, it's not necessary. Um, but, but the fundamental basic belief of Rome and is still correct that we receive the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. Um, so, so that's, you know, that, that's the issue with Rome. The issue isn't so much, you know, it, it's not, it doesn't matter so much in terms of, of whether the bread and wine actually remain, but transubstantiation explains too much. So, but the real issue then beyond that, that we're going to see with Rome, first of all, we're going to have a lot of abuses and we're going to have practices that are just really bad that go on in the middle ages. And as we do explore kind of the later sections of the Augsburg Confession, I want to delve into some of the history and what's going on here and how these practices developed. But the most obvious of these is that for the, the late medieval church, the the one who receives communion the communicant only receives the body of christ and not the blood of christ there is only reception of the host and not of the wine and there are there are arguments for that there are very practical reasons why that idea developed there's a lot of superstition around that that's going to be a, one of the major issues where we say this is a, this is a real abuse of what's going on in the supper because now you're not actually doing what jesus said to do uh, Jesus said, do this. And you're saying, well, we're going to do part of it, but not, not another part of it. So we can talk more about that in another, in a later program as we get into that, but that's going to be, there are going to be these just practices that are, that are problematic. One is, is, um, the issue of the adoration of the host or the idea that the Lord's supper is because it's the body of Christ, which we affirm the, the Roman Catholic argument is that, well, because it's the body of Christ, we worship Christ and we worship Christ's body. He's the incarnate Lord. Uh, so therefore we can worship the host. And so we can keep the host and we can put it in a, in a monstrance, you know, which is this, this, you know, item that contains a host in it. And we have Eucharistic adoration where the host is placed in the monstrance and bowed down to and worshiped and um, apart from the eating. Now the Lutheran reformers in response are going to say, well, we grant theologically that it's the body of Christ uh, and it's not just symbolic, but Christ never told us to worship it. In fact, he told us the very purpose for which he gives us his body. Uh, and that is, you know, we have the command, do this. And then he explains what you are to do. Very, it was a very particular specific purpose, reason for which Christ gives us his body and blood. It's for the forgiveness of sins, for eating and for drinking. So what Rome does is kind of extrapolates from, from things that are at their heart correct to some degree and then kind of distorted. And then there is this, this kind of reasoning well beyond the purpose of the supper that ends up distorting what is the biblical underlying thing that's going on in the supper. Uh, and, and the most significant theological element beyond just the practical stuff is that in the Roman tradition, the Lord's Supper is seen as a sacrifice. Now, to be clear, the early reformers are actually willing to use the language of sacrifice as well, depending on what you mean by it, okay? So the language of sacrifice as tied to the mass or the, the Eucharist, the, the, the sacrament of the altar, that's something that is very clear in the church fathers. We have Irenaeus uses the language of sacrifice, for example. Justin Martyr uses the language of sacrifice. It, it's clear that there's some kind of idea of sacrifice connected to what we do in the Lord's Supper. But those earliest fathers don't really give an extensive explanation of what that means. And, and there's some debate to be had around the phrases that they use and, and what they mean by it. 
But what happens in the medieval church as this this develops, the the idea is essentially this: that Christ's body and blood are re-sacrificed on the altar in the service of the mass. And this becomes the center of the worship service, is a, a re-sacrifice of Jesus. Now eventually that language is going to be is going to be made um, you know, far more clear in that it's not going to be said to be a re-sacrifice per se, but a, but a representation of the once for all sacrifice, meaning it's not different than the sacrifice at Calvary. It's a representation of the same sacrifice on the altar. That, that change comes, uh, I think, largely because of the Reformation, because in the pre-Reformation sources that Luther is dealing with, they're definitely not so careful. And when you do have, you know, a text like Hebrews that specifically says Christ died once, like there, there's no place for another death of Christ. So the, the explanation does end up, end up shifting. So the idea is that the priest acts as an intercessor in the sacrament and offers up the body and blood of Christ as an unbloody sacrifice to God the Father to propitiate the wrath of the Father. And that, that, that's what's going on in the medieval understanding that Luther is uh, responding to here. So in, in response to this, Luther makes a distinction between a sacrifice and a sacrament. And this distinction says that, well, a sacrament is a holy thing that God gives to us. It's a gift of God down to us. A sacrifice is something that we offer to God and and, and we offer it to God in order to propitiate his wrath. Um, so something like the connection between what the priests were doing in the old covenant in their relationship to God for on behalf of the people of Israel. And, and, and this is a, this particular distinction, of course, like, yeah, sacrifice can mean other things too, but we're just linguistically, this is how Luther chooses to define these words in making this particular distinction. Okay. So the idea is that there's a difference between what Rome says, which is it's the priest offering up the sacrifice to the father. Whereas Luther's saying, no, the father sends the son, right? The son comes down to the altar and the pastor is the means by which that gift of the father who's sending the son comes through the words of the pastor, through the elements, and is received by the congregants. So the direction of worship shifts, the direction of what's going on in the supper shifts from priest for the people to God, and then it's God through the priest to us. That's the Lutheran perspective. So you see those, those two different views. And this does end up very practical. It's practical for a lot of reasons. A lot of practices in the church depend on a particular approach to sacrifice. So, for example, private masses, the idea that uh, the priest can offer up, you know, private masses on behalf of on behalf of someone who's not even there. Because, well, the essential or fundamental thing that's going on is the priest offering the sacrifice to the father. So even if the one who the sacrifice is offered for isn't there, they can still receive the benefits of it. And, and that is this kind of rending of the sacrifice or the, the what the priest is doing, what the pastor is doing from the actual reception by the congregant or the communicant. And that's the kind of corruption that we would point out that's going on in the church, which is not consistent with the early church. And it's not consistent certainly with scripture because Jesus commands all of this in a particular context which is that it's done in, in the communion of like with the, the, the fellowship of the saints all together in one place that's the, the pastor's role uh, here, whatever it may be, is for the purpose of the partaking of that in this communal fellowship in the church as we are gathered together. So that's been torn apart. Now, we can talk, as I mentioned, the church fathers do speak about it at the supper as a sacrifice, Philip Melanchthon has a lot of writing on this, uh, especially in the Apology of the Augsburg Confession. And there's there's some ways we can talk about sacrifice in connection to, um, to the supper. For example, the term Eucharist literally means thanksgiving. Uh, part of what's going on when we commune with God, when we fellowship with God, and we do this in the, in the worship service, is that as he grants his grace to us, we respond with thanksgiving. And there is a sacrifice of thanksgiving. This is what Paul references in Romans 12, for example, that we are living sacrifices. So we are to offer ourselves as a sacrifice of thanksgiving and to praise. So can we talk about sacrifice in the sacrament of the altar? Yeah, in a sense, if what we're saying is as God gives us his grace, we offer ourselves 
as a living sacrifice in thanksgiving. So our sacrifice is a response of praise to Christ's once for all sacrifice for us. And, you know, beyond that too, we would certainly say that the sacrifice of Jesus and the benefits of his, the benefits of his sacrifice are delivered through the sacrament. Because as Jesus says, this is given uh, for the forgiveness of sins. It's his body and blood for the forgiveness of sins. So we receive it for the forgiveness of sins. Why do we have the forgiveness of sins? Because Jesus accomplished in one salvation for us through his life, death, and resurrection. So, you know, we could say this, that when the fathers speak, for example, about the Eucharist as a sacrifice, is it what they're saying that essentially the benefits of the sacrifice are given to us in the supper? Yeah, sure. You know, there, there's no issue there. So it, it, a lot of it depends on what you mean by the terminology as we kind of unpack that a bit. Um, and so, especially when we're looking at the fathers, and that's a whole kind of whole separate question. We could delve quite a bit into what exactly the fathers do mean by sacrifice and how it's being used. And I would say there's a lot of variance there in the in the early church, but 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 none of those fathers are going to have this idea that you can have this total separation of what the priest is doing and the actual communion of individuals together in a gathered body. Like that happens much later. That's not something that's consistent at all with what's going on in, it's certainly in the scriptural picture, but also in the early church. Um, so that element of sacrifice is really, in, in the way that sacrifice is understood in the medieval church is going to shape a lot of the abuses of Rome. So that's going to be really where the Lutheran reformers are going to that's where they're going to fight, right? That's where they're going to fight what's going on in Rome. Not so much the transubstantiation issue. That is not that important. The important thing is how this gets distorted because of their notion of sacrifice and how their idea of sacrifice is explained and then leads to these abuses, which are inconsistent with just the, the biblical presentation of what the Lord's Supper is all about. Um, so, but that's not really the focus here of this particular article. I know we're you know, I'm not just explaining this article, I'm going beyond that, uh, because I want us to get the whole historical picture of what's going on and what the concern of the reformers is. So they're going to save the specifics of those criticisms for later. So first, they're going to lay out, here are the areas of agreement. We all agree. Right? We agree, as is true within the Catholic tradition, that the body and blood of Christ are received. When, when we receive... Um, the host, we're receiving the real body of Jesus. When we're receiving the, the cup and the contents of the cup, we are receiving the real blood of Jesus. Okay, that is true. That's agreement. We are all agreed here. The Lutheran reformers are working within that broader sacramental Catholic tradition here. So uh, that lays out, you know, our, our first half of this program as we is kind of lay the, the theological foundation of what's going on historically. But throughout this program, or this, this series, what I've tried to do is lay some of the historical foundation, but then also get into the scriptural foundation. So historically, here's the context. These are the, the different sides. This is where the Lutheran reformers are kind of in the middle. And as we're going to see, and as we've already seen throughout this series, like the Lutheran position ends up being kind of here, right? We've got Rome on this side, and we've got the Zwinglians on this side, and the Lutheran reformers are trying to keep a middle path, one that is consistent with the historic Christian tradition and and holds to the primacy of scripture and does not kind of veer off into the the kind of abuses that happen within within the medieval church and the prioritizing of tradition in a way that God has not given authority to to tradition. Well, where in scripture do we get this idea that uh, we're really receiving the body and blood of Jesus that something more than than a symbolic act is going on. Now, there are a lot of places we can go. I've done podcasts on this in the past, multiple podcasts. I did a, what, three, four part series. And I know this wasn't a YouTube video. This is before I was doing most of my things on YouTube. It was really mostly focused on the, the audio podcast, but I did a three, two, four part series on, on the supper, uh, dealing with the history, the, the New Testament evidence, and um, some of the theological issues going on there and debates. So you can check that out in the podcast feed. Uh, I also have the, you know, five reasons uh, to believe that the body and blood of Christ are present in the sacrament on YouTube. So you can check that out too for a summary of some of these points. So I think a great place to go though is is the book of 1 Corinthians because a lot of the debate surrounding the Lord's Supper tends to center on the words of institution. And while I don't want to say that's not important because it is, of course, you know, the, the institution of Jesus is is key. We have to read those words of institution in light of the rest of the biblical testimony surrounding the sacrament of the altar. 
And there, there are a couple places we can go for that. One is that we can look at the Old Testament types or the Old Testament pictures of the sacrament of the altar. Uh, the, the preparatory things that God has given his people and say, what was the function of that? Because the Lord's Supper is a fulfillment of these Old Testament types. So we can garner a lot of theology from looking at what was the purpose or function of those Old Testament types. But the other place we want to go is the book of 1 Corinthians. Because in the book of 1 Corinthians, we, have, we do have a repeat of those words of institution, the words of Jesus himself. But Paul, in writing to the Corinthian church, deals with a lot of just regular church problems, ones that we're not immune to today that are pretty common, honestly. And some of the abuses that are going on in the Corinthian church have to do with how the Lord's Supper is being celebrated. And there are people who are getting drunk during the Lord's Supper. There are people who are, you know, fighting over how much bread everybody gets and they're shoving people out of the way and stealing bread from others. There's all sorts of wacky stuff going on. Now, the great thing about problems in the church uh, and heresies, <laughs> can there be a great thing? Yeah, uh, and that is that this forces the church to then deal with the issues by outlining what is right. When we see the error, we're, we're forced then to get more in detail about what's right. So Paul does this as he's explaining what's going on in the sacrament of, of the Lord's Supper. So there are two sections in 1 Corinthians that deal with the Lord's Supper that give us some really helpful comments regarding what's going on in the supper. The first is from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And this starts in verse 14. He says this, Therefore, my beloved, shun the worship of idols. I speak as to sensible men. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing, which we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread, which we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all take of one bread. And so, and, and we can move on. There's there's more to say lower but in, in that particular passage. But let me just stop there and say a couple things. This notion of a, of a participation or a sharing or in a fellowship, it all depends on which translation you're using, but, but they all have some, some kind of phraseology like that. Uh, is that the, the language is very clear that there is something more going on than simply remembering the blood of Jesus or remembering the body of Jesus. And this is a participation or, or a sharing in. So the question is, what does that mean? Because it certainly sounds like something more is going on in the supper than just remembering the, the body of Jesus or remembering the blood of Jesus or celebrating the body or celebrating the blood. The language is of, of partaking or of fellowshipping or of sharing. And there is one way that a lot of people have responded to this. And this is what Zwingli did. So in response to this, Zwingli said, okay, well, he, first of all, he grants that the language there is of sharing. So he can't, he can't ignore that. He, he doesn't try to make an argument that this should better be translated as it's a remembrance of the body of Christ. You really can't, from the Greek, make that argument. Um, so, so he doesn't go there. You, you really can't go there. So instead, what he says is, well, when we partake of the body of Christ or we share in the body of Christ, this has to do with the sharing in the church. We share in the body of Christ, that is, the fellowship of believers. Now, this actually makes some sense contextually. You know, I say that because Paul does continually speak about there being one body, that is, the church. We partake of one bread, and we as a church are one body. And it is certainly Paul's concern, partially, partially there's a theological concern too about the identity of who Jesus is, but it's part of Paul's concern that the church is dividing itself up. It's tearing itself apart. There's division in the body. So maybe all Paul is saying is, well, we share in our fellowship with each other in an earthly sense when we partake of the body of Christ. And sure, that makes a lot of sense. So maybe that's what Paul's saying, and he's not even talking about the actual human body of Jesus. He's just talking about the body as the church. Well, there's one major problem with this interpretation. And that is that he doesn't simply speak about sharing in the body of Christ, 
with the bread, but he also speaks about participating in the blood of Christ, and that's in verse 16. Mm -hmm. So the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? Now, it's true that the phrase body of Christ can be used to refer to the church, or it can be used to refer to the actual physical body of Jesus, according to his human nature. But there is never, in, in the entirety of the New Testament, there is never a time where the blood of Christ refers to the church or something like that. It just, it doesn't do that. It, it's not linguistically tenable. It, but Zwingli tries to make that move. So what Zwingli tries to do with this text is say, okay, well, maybe in blood of Christ, he really means he's calling the church the blood of Christ because the church is covered by the blood of Christ. And that kind of move is simply not taken from the text. There is no precedent anywhere else in the New Testament for that kind of, of usage of the phrase, the blood of Christ. So what's really going on here, it's not that Paul is not concerned with fellowship in the body. He is. But note the logic of what he places where. So he starts, note, for, with the cup rather than the bread which, well, that sounds weird because normally like it's the bread first, right? You receive the body, then you receive the blood. So like what's going on here? Well, Paul starts purposefully with the cup because he, first of all, he knows that he, he's speaking to the Corinthians in this way as if they already know this. Like he says, is it not this? Like, don't you know that this is what's going on here? So he's saying, you already know. First of all, you know that when you partake of the wine, you're sharing in the blood of Christ. But he starts there because what he wants to do in his argumentation, so rhetorically, he wants to move from wine, which they, they're all granting that, yes, we share in the, the blood of Christ, to the bread, so that he can then use that connection to say, also, we partake in the one body of Christ, and we also are one loaf, right? We partake of one loaf that is participating in Jesus, but we also together are the body of Christ in the church. So that's why he makes this reverse, because he is purposefully bringing in this discussion of this horizontal fellowship. So it's he's using body in a twofold way here to say that we do share, participate in the body of Christ, his human nature in, in the bread, but we also are his body as the church. And this sacrament has these vertical dimensions and horizontal dimensions. So that's the logic of, of what Paul is doing here. And you really can't make a very compelling argument that sharing in the blood of Christ means anything other than sharing in the blood of Christ. It, it just, it's not, it, it wouldn't make sense of Paul's argument and the, the logic that he's using here. So the logic is there's a real sharing in Jesus and we also really share in one another. Like there's a real sharing in both ways because something real is going on. There's a real fellowship that we have as we fellowship with Jesus, really fellowship with him. We also are really fellowshipping with one another. Therefore, we got to get our stuff together and the church needs to figure it, its junk out so you're not divided because you're partaking of the same Jesus, the same body, and you're part of the same body in the church. Um, so this is the reason why a lot of the other people like Martin Bootser and John Calvin, they're convinced, they're not convinced by Zwingli's argument regarding this text because Wingley's argument it's not very good like it's not very compelling so um th this is why these figures are willing to say well there's got to be something going on right they're, they're saying there's got to be something else going on here than just kind of this symbolic thing there's got to be a real sharing somehow and that's where these other theories of the supper end up showing up um and ultimately this stems from a different view of the incarnation and this is where Luther and Zwingli end up debating is Zwingli says, well, if Jesus really is human, and we know from even from the creed, right, he's ascended at the right hand of the father. If he's human, human bodies can't be like in a bunch of places. So how can Jesus's human body be like all over the place on all these altars and all these churches? It doesn't make any sense because that's not what a human body does. Therefore, he says, well, his human body is ascended into heaven. So he can't be here in the bread and the wine. Calvin essentially agrees with Zwingli here. Luther puts forth a lengthy argument, and many others do later, about this, this issue, um, trying defending, and I think defending well, the idea that, yes, Jesus does have a true human nature, but also because of the nature of the incarnation, that this human nature is united to the Godhead. This is united to the Son, the eternal Son, the Logos. Because of that, divine powers can be used through the human nature 
not in such a way that the human nature ceases to be human, but because of the union of natures, his human body is not limited in where it can be. But Calvin agrees with Zwingli's argument regarding the human nature of Christ. So that's the reason why he can't take this sharing idea, this sharing language. He can't grab onto that and say, it must mean that Jesus is really here. So that's where he looks for this alternate way of saying, well, somehow we've got to share in Jesus, but he can't really be here. And if Jesus can't come here, the only other option is that I go there where his human nature is. So this is where you have the Holy Spirit as this mediating force. And the language that Calvin uses in, in his institutes is that my soul ascends to the heavenlies to share in the body and blood of Christ. It, it's a very weird explanation, but it's one that he comes up with trying to reconcile what he believes are two truths. And the one is we share in Jesus and the other is Jesus is stuck at the right hand and can't go anywhere else. And of course, we would deny the second, but this is where he comes up with this very confusing idea of, of how it is that we receive Christ in the supper while denying that he's actually present here uh, in the bread and the wine as we, as we partake of the supper. So Paul goes on uh, here. He says in verse 18, consider the practice of Israel are not those who eat the sacrifices partners in the altar. So he's making, he's talking about those who are offering up pagan sacrifices, right? You, you, it's the understanding in pagan sacrifices that you're, you're participating in the worship of that God. There's some kind of real connecting point in this sacrificial act. Um, what do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No. I imply that what pagan sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. And that's so interesting because they're saying there's a real fellowship of people with demons when they're doing pagan sacrifices. I do not want you to be partners with demons. You cannot drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. So he's saying that paganism and this paganism and Christianity cannot mix because when you are doing these pagan practices, you're really, just as you're participating in Christ in the sacrament of the altar, if you're doing this pagan stuff, you're actually sharing in demons, like you're fellowshipping with demons. There's something more going on here than just this external connection to like, I, I am saying something about a demon or remembering a demon. Like the, the whole point of the argument is, is based on something real going on here. There's something real going on here. There's a real fellowship with Jesus. And because we're really sharing in him, this is why that's the kind of sharing that we're supposed to have and we do have with Jesus. But that's why paganism is so bad because if we really share in Jesus, you can't also really share in some intimate way with demon, with the demonic. You can't do that. This is very similar to um, the same argument he, he makes in the same book regarding the question of sexual immorality. You can't share in a prostitute in the way that you share in Christ. And, and it's that language of, of intimacy and, and union that's beyond just you know, some kind of external, I'm identifying myself with Jesus. It's something intimate and real. We're really united with him. And if you're uniting yourself with a prostitute, you can't do that because your union is with Jesus. And that's what's going on here too. So the language is, is of union and of sharing in him and who he is. Then uh, Paul goes on in chapter 11 to describe this a little more. And there's quite a bit here that he says, so, but I'm just going to read part of it. Uh, in verse 23, he, he gives us the words of institution. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And this is like, this is exactly what we use in our liturgy. You know, um, you know when I read this, I want to chant it because that's what I do when I preside over the supper is chant the, um, the words of institution. Uh, it's hard for me to like read that and not do that. So, uh, th but this is, these are the words of Jesus. So this is, he's saying, and he's giving this in a kind of liturgical formula purposefully he's saying, I received this from the Lord, and this is what I delivered to you. Like, these are the words that I gave to you. You know these words. This is what the sacrament of the altar is. This is what's going on. Um, and this is just a, a reiteration of the words of institution that we have in the Synoptic Gospels. Um, John doesn't have the words of institution. There's John 6 
there's a lot of debate around John 6 and what's going on in that discourse. I think it is largely sacramental, but not exclusively sacramental. But that's a kind of another question. Then let's go to verse 27. He says, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty, this is key, of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. What's going on here? Now, this is really key. Because in Calvin's approach to the Lord's Supper, he's not going to say that everyone who receives the body of Christ or the bread actually receives the body of Christ. What he's going to say, it's only those who have faith or really the elect for Calvin. It's only those who have faith that receive Jesus. And they don't really do it through the bread and the wine. But they really only commune with Jesus at the moment that you're also partaking of the bread and the wine. It's kind of a simultaneous thing, but it's not really by means of the bread and wine. It's a different thing. So you can't objectively say, this is the body of Christ. You could say, well, the one who has true faith does commune with Christ as they're partaking of the bread. But the bread is not the body of Christ. This is It's not the body of Christ in, in the performed system. So... What that means is there, there ends up being this, this big disagreement between, and this is, this is a really key point to demonstrate the difference between the Lutheran and Reformed approach to this. There ends up being a debate about the nature of the communion of the unworthy. Whereas the Lutherans say, everyone receives the body of Christ because it's objectively true. It's universal and it's objective, which is part of a broader Lutheran idea that the grace of God, the promises of God, all of them are universal and objective, meaning the word of God is universal and objective. Every time the word of God is proclaimed, the spirit is at work in that word. Um, the, the act of baptism is objective and universal. It's always valid. It's always efficacious. One can reject it, but that doesn't invalidate the baptism itself. There is no empty sacrament. There is no empty word, Okay, um, which is different from how the Reformed are going to, to interpret this. So that plays itself out in this question of the communion of the ungodly. And so for the, the Lutheran, because it's objective and true, everyone you receive the body of Christ because it's the body of Christ, because the word of God says so. It's universally true. It's just true. Now, whether you have faith or unbelief determines whether it benefits you or not. Because Paul's very clear, as he explains here, that you can receive the body of Christ unto condemnation. But the objectivity of what's going on is not dependent on faith. Faith simply receives that which is true and there, right? So faith, the work of faith is receptive. Faith receives what God is doing, what God has done and said. Faith does not create that which God has done and said. So faith doesn't create the reality of the real presence in the sacrament. It receives the reality of the real presence of Christ in the sacrament. That's what faith does. Calvin says the opposite. It's faith that determines whether there's a real sharing in Christ or not. So if you have faith, you share in Christ. And so, so you see it's, it's reversed. But this text is so key because Paul says here that those who, the reason why partaking of the supper in an unworthy way is such a serious sin, so serious that people in Corinth are dying. The reason it's such a serious sin is because you're sinning against the body and blood of the Lord, he says. You're profaning the body of the Lord and blood of the Lord. So you're profaning something that is holy. In other words, it is the body of the Lord. Like that's the whole point of the argument. It rests on the notion that this is the real body of Jesus that we're receiving in the sacrament. And that's why your sin is so serious. And he doesn't just say, you know, notice that Paul doesn't just say, you're guilty of sinning against God because God has given you a command to like be worthy when you take the bread and wine. Uh, he doesn't, he doesn't just you know, use the general language of sin or breaking God's laws or breaking God's commandments or even just sinning against the Son or sinning against Jesus. But it, he gets very specific so that what you're sinning against is the body of Jesus and what you're sinning against is the blood of Jesus. So it's very particular so that if you're sinning in the supper, why it matters so much is that it is the very place where God himself is present. The Son is present in his body and blood. And there, there's where we have this kind of parallel between what's going on here and the seriousness here that leads to death even and what happens in the Old Covenant, right? In the Old Testament, those holy places where Jesus, where, where God himself is, like the temple or like Mount Sinai, 
if you were to approach that unworthily, because of your sin, you would die. And that is what Paul's drawing on in his explanation of the supper. It's the same thing. Because it is so holy, because it is where God himself is here, if you approach God unworthily in this way, without without faith and repentance, you die. <laughs> like the same kind of thing is happening here. He's showing this connection. So it, it really only makes sense with a, a perspective that something is going on, not just for those who have faith, but also objectively for those who don't, because that's the reason for their sinning against the body and blood of Christ. And that's the reason why it's so serious. So yeah, we spent this time looking at, you know, first Corinthians, and I wanted to spend time here more than other places, um, just because I think that this lays out the case really well. If we're going to go to like one set of texts, one part of scripture that lays all of it out, this is really the place where I'd go. There's even a lot more to say on this text. Um, but let me just say in the few minutes we have left before we end here, the the question always comes up then, well, Jesus, when Jesus says, this is my body, right? There, there's a lot of debate over whether that's symbolic or not. When Jesus says, this is my body, does Jesus mean it is his body? And we would say, yes. What, what Jesus held in his hand, he said, this is my body. It is exactly what he said. That is his body. And when we say those words of institution at the church service, when we hold up that host and say, this is my body, um, it is Jesus's body. It, it really is. It is not representative of Jesus's body. And there's so much to say about that that sentence that we could spend a whole and a half, spend a whole program on that question of, of the words of institution. But let me just say a couple things. One is if you're going to identify this is my body as a, a symbolic statement, you have to ask the question, which part of that statement is, is the symbol? Is it this? Most people are going to say no. Andreas Karlstadt, uh, who was an associate of Luther, actually said, Yes, that Jesus, when he said, this is my body, he was pointing to himself. This is my body given for you and then gave bread. It was weird interpretation. Most people don't take that. Um, so is it body? Well, it can't really be body because he's saying my body broken for you. Like most people recognize that when he's referencing body, he's referencing his real body because he's identifying it with what's about to happen on the cross. So the body part isn't symbolic. Most people aren't going to argue for that. So where people go and they say where their symbolism is in the term is, they're going to say, well, is is the symbolic term. Right? Is means represents. And so the question is, does is mean represents in, in that phrase? Does it mean represents? Well, in order to establish that, you'd have to see one that contextually there's a reason for take for not taking it literally. Right? You should you should basically assume what is the straightforward reading unless there's significant textual evidence and reason to see otherwise and sometimes there is because of the you know poetic genre that's very clear there or you know there are various other clues within the text and genre and things like that to say okay something else is going on there first of all i would say i just i don't i don't see that there i don't see that there um and even when when you look at the the surrounding context of the passover meal you have the killing of the lamb and the actual eating of the lamb not a symbol of the lamb um, you have all of the, you know, old covenant uh, portrayals of what becomes the Lord's Supper of this miraculous bread from heaven, the manna that's received that Paul that connects with the Lord's Supper. There, there is a, when you kill a sacrifice in the Old Testament, in the Levitical law, those sacrifices that were eaten, because not all of them were, but those that were eaten were just that, eaten, like not a symbol of the sacrifice. The actual sacrifice was the thing that was eaten. And the process of sacrifice involved both the killing of the sacrifice as well as the consuming of the sacrifice. It's all part of one sacrificial act. So all of that background just makes the most sense of, of this being understood in that, that context. So there, there's no textual evidence there, not sufficient textual evidence to see that as a kind of symbolic language. But the other thing is we would have to see some, some parallel uses of symbolic language, especially within the Gospels, um, because it's... You know, it's the same authors. They're using the same Jesus <laughs> explaining what he had to say. So the question is, are there, you know, are there parallel texts in the Gospels themselves, specifically in the mouth of Jesus? We could say otherwise too, but specifically it would be, it would be a better argument if we could find it in, in the words of Jesus to say, well, does Jesus use is as represents in other places? Like, is that a common thing that Jesus does? 
Is that a linguistic construction he has? Well, the, the thing that people will point to most often is where Jesus says things like, well, um, I am the vine, right? I am the vine. Saying, well, of course, that's symbolic. We all know Jesus like isn't literally a vine, which is true. Like, we're not going to say Jesus never uses figurative language. And we would say, well, because this is kind of parabolic, it's one of these I am statements we, we have, and specifically because we know Jesus isn't a plant. I mean, contextually, that would make no, no sense either. Like, we have enough... You know, we have enough textual evidence to say, like, hermeneutically, no one's going to come to the conclusion that Jesus is a plant, like literally a plant. I mean, maybe somebody does. I don't know. But but most of us aren't literalists in that sense. And we're going to be like, okay, clearly there there's something going on in terms of, of the use of symbolic language here. So we'll grant that, of course. But the question is, is a statement like that, is that statement parallel to this is my body? Because what you have to establish is not only that Jesus uses symbolic language, which of course he does, but that there is a precedent for using symbolic language in the same way that the Lord's Supper is supposedly symbolic language, and that is would have to be the symbolic sense. What you would have to do is find a phrase that said that that where Jesus what Jesus says when he says I am or this is something, where is or am means represents. And that's not the case with I am the vine or, or those sim other similar statements or I am the door, or these kind of things. No, I am the door. When Jesus says that, for example, he's not saying I represent the door. No, he's saying I am, I really am the door, but what's symbolic is door, right? He really is, you know, the the, the entrance into the, the heavenly throne room of the Father, like a door would be. Uh, he really is a vine. But what does vine mean? Vine is a symbolic part of that sentence, which means life source in that instance, right? Just like vine and branches, branches receive their life from the vine. We receive our life from him. So they're not parallel statements. And you can't find a parallel statement in the words of Jesus to this is my body, where is means represents. Because that's that's not a figure of speech that Jesus uses. That's not what's going on in the text. So there's plenty more to say about that. We can delve into some other arguments from exegetes on that question. And there's there's plenty to say. There's been a lot written on that in the last 500 years. But um, this is part of our ongoing series on the Augsburg Confession. I hope you appreciated this. If you haven't watched the other ones, uh, feel free to. This is meant to be kind of introduction to Lutheran doctrine as we walk through what the Augsburg Confession says, what's going on in, in terms of historical context for that each particular article, and then what the biblical precedent is uh, for those things. So thanks so much. Please do make sure to subscribe uh, on the YouTube channel as well as on your podcast app, and we'll see you in the next one. God bless.